Welcome back to Fear the Black Messiah, where we highlight lesser known figures, lesser known events in the black community. If you rocking with our content, put some on the cash app so we can help expand this program. Let's get to it. All right, let's talk about Reginald F. Lewis, the first black billionaire in America. We ain't talking no regular rich, man. We talking about someone who broke down the barrier, knocked down doors that wasn't meant for us, and made power moves nobody else was making back in the day. This ain't just a story about money, nah. This is a story about grit, hustle, and how to go from streets to corporate suites without losing your cool. Reginald F. Lewis was born in 1942 in Baltimore, Maryland, a city with a rough edge, no doubt. Baltimore was a place where you either made it or got lost in the sauce, aka the system, especially for black folks. Back in those days, segregation was real, and opportunities for black families were few and far in between. But even growing up in that environment, Reginald was built different. His family wasn't rich by any means, but they had pride and they had drive. His mother, Carolyn, played a big role in pushing Reginald to dream bigger than his surroundings. From a young age, he had this hustle mindset. Lewis knew that the world wasn't set up for him to win, but he also knew he wasn't trying to take no for an answer. Paul Lawrence Dunbar High was where it all started to show. He wasn't just another kid. He was a star on the football team and a standout in the classroom. He was grinding on both ends, balancing school and sports, and always keeping his eye out for the bigger picture. It wasn't enough to be good. He wanted to be great. That hunger was something his classmates noticed early on. Lewis wasn't the loudest in the room, but he had that quiet confidence, that kind that told people, watch what I'm about to do. After high school, Lewis went on to Virginia State University, an HBCU that's known for producing some strong black leaders. While there, Reginald wasn't just messing around, enjoying that college life. Nah, he had a plan. He studied political science and economics, two fields that gave him the tools he needed to understand how the world worked. More than that is where he started putting together the pieces of what he would eventually do in the business world. Now, here's where the story gets wild. After graduating from Virginia State, Lewis wasn't done. He had bigger dreams, and that dream was Harvard Law. But check this out, he didn't just apply to Harvard the regular way. Most people sit there, write out their applications, and wait for a response, not Reginald. He walked straight into Harvard Law, talked his way into an interview, and ended up getting accepted. That kind of boldness, you can't teach that. It's just in you. In 1965, Lewis entered Harvard Law School, becoming one of the only few black students in his class. Now, being that the predominantly white institution like Harvard, especially during the 1960s, it wasn't a walk in the park. Racism wasn't just subtle, it was in your face. But Lewis didn't let that face him. He put his head down and did the work and graduated in 1968. Armed with a law degree that would open doors, he was about to just kick down anyway. Once Lewis had that Harvard degree in hand, he started out like most law grads, working at a big law firm, but this was temporary. You could tell he wasn't satisfied with just punching the clock. He had that entrepreneurial spirit, something folks didn't even recognize back then. Black lawyers at the time were expected to just stay in their lane, but Reginald was plotting. In 1970, he made his first big move, he opened up his own law firm called Lewis and Clarkson, making him one of the first black folks to run a law firm on Wall Street. Now that's major. And the firm wasn't just about taking small cases. Lewis specialized in mergers and acquisitions, deal making on the highest levels of business. He was out here advising major companies, helping minority owned businesses get a leg up and proving that black lawyers could play in spaces that were supposed to be off limit. Now let's get to the real money moves. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, Lewis made a pivot that would change his life forever. He got into leveraged buyout. For folks who don't know what that is, that's when you use borrow money to buy out companies turn them around and sell them for a profit. It's a risky game, but if you do it right, the rewards are massive. This is where Reginald started to shine. He wasn't just reading the room, he was reading the whole building. He had an eye for deals, spotting companies that had potential but were undervalued. He would take them over, cut costs, and flip them for millions. This wasn't just about making a few dollars. Lewis was building an empire. He was one of the few black men in America playing this game and he was doing it better than most white folks who had been in the business for years. All right, so here's where history gets made. In 1987, Lewis made the deal that would put his name in the record books. He bought Beatrice International Foods for $985 million. Let that sink in. Round that up, that's a billion dollars. At the time, it was the biggest leverage buy 
buyout ever by a black man and it sent shockwaves throughout the business world. People couldn't believe that a black man had just taken over a multinational company, but Lewis wasn't playing. He took over TLC Beatrice, a company that had operations in over 30 countries. This wasn't just some small time operation. TLC Beatrice was a global force running supermarkets, producing snacks, and distributing beverages all over Europe and Africa. Reginald took control of all of it. He wasn't just the first black billionaire, he was the smartest businessman in the game. Under his leadership, the company thrived. Lewis made sure it grew, cut out parts that weren't making money, and kept the business moving forward. He wasn't just about building wealth for himself, he was about creating a legacy. With the success of TLC Beatrice, Lewis officially became America's first black billionaire. But for Reginald, it wasn't just about stacking paper. It was about what the paper represented. He knew his success wasn't just personal, it was symbolic. He shattered a glass ceiling, proving to a generation of black entrepreneurs that anything was possible. But here's the thing, Lewis didn't flaunt his money. He was low key about it. He wasn't about being flashy. He was about being effective. He knew the real flex wasn't showing off. It was in making the moves that would last. And while he had the money, he also had the mindset that came with it. Lewis believed in hard work and being prepared and in never waiting for permission to take what's yours. Lewis didn't just stop at making money. He wanted to share his story and philosophy with the world. That's when he wrote his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? The title alone tells you everything you need to know about how Reginald thought. He wasn't here for white folks to be the only ones running the show. He wanted black folks to get in on the action too. In the book, Lewis laid out his journey. But more than that, he dropped gems for aspiring entrepreneurs. He talked about how important it was to understand businesses, to be ready to pivot when necessary, and to never accept the limitations society places on you. It was a blueprint, not just for making money, but for living on your own terms. Let me keep it real for a minute. Being a black man in business, especially in the 80s and 90s, wasn't easy. Reginald faced racism at every corner, even while he was at the top. There were folks who didn't want to see him succeed, who thought a black man had no business making billion dollar moves. But instead of letting that stop him, Lewis used it as fuel. He wasn't just fighting for himself, he was fighting for every black entrepreneur who came after him. Even with all the money and success, Lewis never forgot what it was like to be that kid in Baltimore hustling to make something out of nothing. He carried that with him into every deal, every boardroom, and every meeting. And when folks tried to box him in or tell him he didn't belong, he showed them exactly why he did. Lewis wasn't just about personal success. He believed in giving back to his community, and that's why he started the Reginald F. Lewis Foundation. Even after his death in 1993, the foundation continues to support causes that matter to him, from education to arts and entrepreneurship. The foundation makes sure that the black communities have access to the resources they need to thrive. Lewis knew that the fight for economic power wasn't over just because he made it. He wanted to open doors for others to make sure that young black kids knew that they could be anything they wanted to be, even billionaires. His philanthropy wasn't just about writing checks, it was about creating opportunities for the next generation. While alive, Lewis made his desire to support a museum of African-American culture. In 2005, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African-American History and Culture opened in Baltimore with the support of a five million grant from his foundation. It is the East Coast's largest African-American museum occupying an 82,000 square foot facility with permanent and special exhibition space. Interactive learning environments, auditorium, resource center, oral history, recording audios, museum shop, cafe, classrooms, meeting rooms, outside terrace, and reception areas. It highlights the history and accomplishment of African Americans with a special focus on Maryland's Black American community. The museum is also a Smithsonian affiliate. On January 19, 1993, Lewis died at the age of 50 from brain cancer. His wife, Loita Nichols Lewis, took over the company a year after his death and sold it in 1999. RIP to Reginald F. Lewis, a pioneer in Black American history.